Ta. Back to human 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 architecture, broadcasting from our cosmopolitan coastal city of Honolulu, Hawaii. And today is our April Fool Day edition of 2020. But my uh, co-caster DeSoto, how how are you? Well, I'm fine, and it's no joke that it's April Fool's Day, and you're in Germany, and I'm in Honolulu. Exactly, and the, the the reasons for that are too serious to make a joke about is that True. our corona conditions, so um, we're happy to be safe and sound, and you guys hopefully as well, and gives you even more better chance to sit down and relax and be edutained by us. Yeah. And uh, our message is, as always, optimistic, uh, maybe particularly in these conditions, and we want to have a, an, an optimistic outlook uh, uh, a year ahead of us, where I'm hoping to take you to Soto and a bunch of others who we get excited about through these shows here that we've been doing um, a couple already, and uh, taking you guys with me to Germany, where I'm from, and where me and my family business have been the, has had the chance to build this kind of body of work that has a lot to do with the many things that um, are uh, challenging us uh, on the islands and also create a lot of opportunities. And so uh, we've been walking through um, pretty much foundations, or early childhood. We've been talking about higher education. Uh, we've been talking about grocery, how do we get our food? And we ended up being at transportation, which is number two as the biggest carbon uh, consumer in the world. And so, uh, and we want to talk about uh, light transportation, even lighter than we're finally getting it in Honolulu, which is actually rather heavy. And we're yeah. Thing we want to revisit, actually, that's something that you confirmed to me as being from the island is a tradition on the island, which is light rail. Yes. And um, so we've been looking at a project last time and did sort of this virtual drive and stuff by every station, only as appetizers, because we want to keep you excited about doing that with us in real and nothing beats the real deal. But today we want to introduce another project. But before we do that, can we go to the first slide where... We basically see them both at the top right. Uh, at the top is the expo stations, for, which were built for the expo in 2000. And below that is the project we're going to talk about. But if we go to slide number two, uh, we want to share or briefly touch three lessons that we learned through the project. And the first lesson, um, you remember what that was, DeSoto, when we talked about it the other day? Uh, I can't remember now what order they were in, but I do know that well, uh, it, it, you, you discussed how, after the project was completed or nearly completed, you went through, a, because you were a young architect at the time, it was a learning process for what you went through as these train stations or these shelters at the light rail stations were constructed, um, and some of the criticism yeah. that you got that you learned from. Exactly. And the slide number two, we actually see a publication by a gentleman who used to work for Arab, which is one of the largest architecture and engineering firms in the world. And this is from a book that they gave us when, uh, on the right side, the quotes are from a book that they gave to us. And again, what we learned is that when we went into this competition, for reasons we explained last time, so you guys got to watch that show and then obviously travel with us to hear the full story. We had little to no hope that we would ever, you know, win the competition or build it, but we did. And there's something that that surprised you to maybe learn from that architectural fees and engineering fees in Europe and in Germany are fixed, so you can't negotiate. So you can actually pick the structural engineer and the architect by how much you like their work, and right. you know. Right. And it's not by how much they cost, because when you said in America, that would be considered to be what? Well, it would be considered to be socialism if those prices were fixed 
and people in the USA would be up in arms about how dare you do that and interrupt the free market system. But as you pointed out, it enables clients to be able to get architectural work done that they can afford to pay for, which in the United yeah. States is very difficult in most cases, particularly for smaller smaller clients who can't afford it. Exactly. So uh, when we're there on site, we'll tell you the full story. There's a funny story about how I learned the hard way. Always to work with your <laughs> collaborators, with the engineers from the very beginning, right. not until the end. You'll laugh because you like the story. The I next did. slide here, number three, is uh, unfortunately, as we only have one architectural magazine left, which is the architectural record, same in the UK, the only one left with the main one is the architectural review, that they were launching an award um, and we were, you know, lucky to uh, have been one of the recipients. And one of the jurors here was was a colleague of mine, uh, Billy Chin, who was rather critical and been quoted that way, as you see at the very bottom right. And once again, just like when we challenge the emerging generation in studio reviews and stuff like that, that's not what you want to hear to begin with, but it's what you need. And, you know, I haven't been any different, and I'm still that way. I learned the most. We all learn the most from mistakes and not from whatever successes we have. And I wanted and so, to point out that the, the, the quote from Billy that's reproduced here um, is exactly what the same things that I came to on my own when we were discussing this, 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 this train, these tr system of train um, shelters. And one of the th I said two things differentiating each station by its appearance not only help identify it, but it also gives the person riding on the vehicle the chance to see the progression of the stations. In other words, because everyone is not identical, because everyone is different, you as a passenger are kind of anticipating, what's the next one going to be? I want to see it. And the, mm -hmm. the jurors in this particular case, the other three jurors, convinced this one woman that uh, who objected, she thought, to what, what, how cosmetic these, these different uh, appearances were, that no, that was what the, the benefit of doing it that way was. And I felt really good that when you and I had discussed it, I came to the same conclusion that they did. Mm -hmm. And again, we otherwise we leave it up to all you guys to check it out on your own with us and make up your own opinion because that's the best to do, and that's why we want to go there. The next slide is the uh, cover of the Wallpaper magazine and an article that was called Trump, uh, Travel Top 25. And what, you know, you as, you know, a photographer and, you know, being a sort of a seismograph of what's going on on the island, and you're currently, you know, um, out and about, and we're going to do a couple of shows about your findings in this very specific situation that there we have. It's rather extreme, as we know. So, what was remarkable about these pictures by uh, by this gentleman um, photographer Werner Eichinger, I think was his name. Well, what you and I have become very picky um, about the <laughs> yeah, about the photos that, about the photos that we will use on this program, and taking photos to be as as parallel or as straight as possible. In other words, not tapering off. In other words, everything that's supposed to be a, a vertical upright line is vertical. And these pictures absolutely break those rules because, as you said to me last night, first of all, the photographer took them standing on the tracks, which is forbidden mm -hmm. or forbidden, yeah. as you would say. And yeah. they're all crooked. And there's the obvious use of a flash or some kind of artificial light. So this is breaking all the rules that we like to, to follow when we do our programs on ThinkTech. But this is a professional photographer in a massive international magazine, so if he can break the rules, the rules can be broken sometimes. Exactly. Good exceptions to the rule, as we like to say. That's right. So I'll move on to the next slide here, which is, uh, so we're, we've been talking that we want to do things that Americans have found themes for or worth for, which is POE, post-occupancy evaluation, EBD, evidence-based design, all for life cycle assessment, LCA. So these stations have been around for almost two decades. So, and they're exposed to, you know, uh, the wildest things as far as weather and people and their um, 
behaving or not. So here you can see a rather sort of crowded station, which again, in these days of social distancing, you would have to space them out. Um, but um, again, hopefully we'll get there at some point soon. But you can see how sort of used the station is, how utilized it is, how embraced it is. There must be some kind of, um, you know, high school uh, field trip here. You see, you know, folks of the same young age, and you see bicycles as well. So you can, it's a, it's kind of a mixed transportation mode that the station provides. Uh, the and next I wanted slide to point out before we yeah. go on. I wanted to point out that this picture again re-emphasizes how small this train line is and how small the stations are and the stops are. And that was one of yeah, the very yeah, important yeah. things that you and your father had to deal with in the course of designing these shelters, how confined mm -hmm. everything was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So next slide, number, uh, number six is the early pioneers of what we want to do is they have been inspired uh, they've been inspiring that because this is Siraj and Chris, who some years ago, when we still had the Copenhagen program, came over and wanted to check some of uh, the projects we've been doing. So here they are. And uh, the next page, number... Before we go on, uh, where are they from? Uh, they're they're, they're uh, students of the University of Hawaii, uh, but... Um, uh, their their ethical background is Sri Lanka for Siraj and for Chris uh, he's Filipino. Yeah, and these they, guys are international. Yeah. They they aren't just local. They are from Asia and they are visiting Germany. They are, and they've been the they've been in Hawaii for a while for study reasons and for family reasons. So they've been on the island. Just their ethical background is from all over the place, as we most of us are in Hawaii. And again, uh, they're. They basically said that this um, sort of trip they had had sort of a, um, a life-changing impact on their, I mean, not, not specifically the branch to me, but, but going to Copenhagen, experiencing Europe, is just something that, you know, ever since they came back, they were different people. That's what they were saying. And move on to the next slide. We're actually sitting, when we took this picture, we're sitting in a cafe on the other side of uh, this particular train station. And uh, in the distance, you can see probably a, a situation of social distancing more to what we would see out if we would uh, be able to go out at all and would be banned to be, be, be at home, right? But here you can see, which, which makes me very happy because all these awards, all these publications don't mean anything compared to when you see that the buildings you imagined uh, gave birth to uh, basically fulfill uh, the hopes you had here, you know, of inclusivity, of having people of all kinds who can, can't afford to use private transportation or they don't want to for other reasons. And again, I mean, you would normally think of, of, of Germany as a pretty sort of a white culture, right, with lots of Caucasians. Yeah. yeah. But you can see the results of Angela Merkel's welcoming culture in having people from all colors of skins and, and all, you know, religious uh, confessions here pretty much peacefully aligned on the platform. Yeah. Uh, so you might remember the car in front, that's our pi mobile in Germany, our little Twingo that we've been talking about here and then. So the next slide, number eight, is when we parked, there was a car next to us. Or the maker of the Twingo is Renault, the French automaker, and the one next to it is an electric version uh, called a Twitzy. And Siraj is, is, and Chris too are in their final sprint of that DRX project in um, Chris has said that this car was one of the initiations to make him do what he's doing in rethinking transportation in Waikiki and, and back home very yeah. much. Yeah. So let's move to the next project and uh, next page here, number nine, and tell us what that strange apparatus there is <laughs> because some of the younger audience people might not even know what that is. <laughs> that strange cream-colored object in the lower left corner is the telephone that I am talking on right this minute to do this program. And it was one that I purchased in the early 1980s at the Phone Mart store at the Ward Warehouse, which unfortunately is now gone. And um, that's because I'm using a landline technology to do these shows now, and it is a dial telephone 
not a push button phone, that's how old fashioned it is, but it has a color that's particularly relevant for this particular slide, and you describe why. Well, again, talking about, you know, made in America and made to last, there we go, right? There we go. We need again. Our iPhones, how long do they last? Like two, three years, and then they're ready for the landfill, right? So oh, yeah. that was the way to go. And yes, uh, the color is an indication of the zeitgeist. And again, we were, the image we showed last time before is where my mother here with me and my sister standing in front of two cars who have the same creamy color. And that's very typical for the early early 70s, you know, uh, sorry, late 70s and sort of early 80s, then they, they were all into the cream colors. And I forgot to say, which I will add now, is that while, you know, the cars are sitting there, we already talked that we didn't need them much because everything was walkable, but when we wanted to go to town, to downtown, there was actually a, a light rail station relatively close by that in my early childhood memories was on grade, and I have vivid memories of what stores we passed and stuff like that. And then in the in the 70s, uh, they did this massive undertaking to put everything on the ground, meaning a subway. And so that was uh, what, what I was writing then for the later part of my youth. And this is a typology that, for that reason, is familiar to me ever since my childhood. And the next slide is how we when, uh, were approached to um, address that typology. What you find is picture pretty surreal. We're actually asking, is that that particular station we had to deal with? That's number 10, right, with a, with with a cascading down water. With a waterfall, uh, with an unintended, uh, unplanned waterfall. Yeah. And, well, that's you know, something now we're... That, I was just going to say that um, something to keep in mind that whenever you build anything below grade or underground, there's the possibility mm -hmm. of flooding. And it may be yep. rare, and it may be very unusual, but when it happens, it can be not only destructive, but incredibly disruptive. It causes a lot mm -hmm. of financial damage as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. So the client here is the, the public transportation company in the city of Bochum, which is more in central Germany in the former steel belt. Um, they figured if they would cover up the stations to keep the rain off, they would long-term save on maintenance, and that's why they basically launched, once again, an architectural competition. And we, on the next slide, by now you guys know we're fans of physical models. This is a, this is a sort of a zoom into the base of the model, which simulates the condition from coming out of the dark tunnel, going into the light up there. And I think the challenge we thought is sort of adjust the eye from the very dark to the very bright. Plus, there was another circumstance to consider, which was code, basically mandated by the Department of Motor Vehicles in that case, and not the building department, because it's a piece of infrastructure. It said your structure has to withstand the impact of a truck running into it. And we thought, oh, well, welcome back to postmodernism. we got to make big, chunky, ugly columns. Of course, we didn't want to do that. So the sort of the answer, the, the, the gestalt answer to these challenges or to these, uh, you know, circumstances illustrated by the next slide, which shows you the upper part of the model and shows you our solution. And what was that, DeSoto? How did we well, solve that? I, I, we should point out that this obviously is a street level view. And mm -hmm. because the road is running directly next to this, which is the entryway to a subway, um, that's why you are dealing with this uh, code problem or code situation of being able to withstand the impact of a truck that would be driving right on the right next to the thing. So instead of building several large support columns, what you guys chose to do was to build multiple smaller steel columns and cantilevered structures, individual ones, sort of L-shaped, which are anchored in a concrete base. And with the redundancy of multiple steel supports, you could do away with the single or more uh, fewer really substantial concrete supports. So you end up with this very light, delicate looking structure, which actually is very strong. Mm hmm Well put. Thank you. And there's an, there's an upper part in that picture, and we leave this for when you guys join us out there, why the working title for that project is Urban Waterfall. 
And the next slide is we might bring this uh, printout of the construction document, which is one sheet, and everything is on there. But if you zoom, if you look close, this gives you a clue how complex that drawing is. Because once again, um, this is obviously within the school of thought of us being essential, essentialist. And essentialism is very complex because actually making things disappear is, is more difficult and more challenging than adding on and adding on and cluttering things. We all know this, how this is, you know, cluttering is easy at home, but cleaning things up yeah. and keeping things tidy is more challenging. Right? That's absolutely right. And I think the other thing that we discussed earlier was um, it may look uncomplicated, the structure itself, when we look at pictures of it, but as these drawings show, and as, they, as you have said, the complexity is not evident when you just look upon it, because all of it is yeah. covered up. Yeah, yeah. And so if we go to the next slide, number uh, number 14 here, this is an, uh, well, this is an indication about materiality, and I was already giving you a hint. We were operating within the former steel belt of Germany, so that, you know, had an influence on our charge of materials, and also has an, an impact on, uh, again, which is, important to sort of revive, which is the tradition of the master builder, to so someone who also, you know, while thinking about how to design something, thinks about how to put it together, and then has control over it through all the architectural phases, which we always had. I have to right. say, we can jump to the next picture here, that um, actually um, the, the time it took for it to be built was almost, was more than a decade. Uh, because the, this is how globalism, which we're experiencing now the hard way, is impacting little people, which happens left and right now with all the people in the, in the hospitality industry and the gastronomy and all these people who have a hard time making it. Here, uh, the city of Bochum um, is, has been for you know, a very long time uh, the city of Opel, and Opel very early, as you point out, and as, a, as an expert also in automotive history has been bought by GM. And when J GM got in trouble, not that long ago, Bochum got in trouble. So this thing, Architect, got in trouble. So this project got in trouble. It was on hold um, on and off for almost a decade. And then basically the client was then, while I was already in the U.S., uh, the client was actually doing the final phase of construction supervision in, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, fantastic way, and again, I would like to have the client come out when we're there and express all the challenges that, that he had from, from his opinion, which is obviously a different point of view than, than mine. Yeah. Um, so, we go to the next slide. Um, Got to hurry up a little bit. We only got two minutes left, but we also have a few slides left. So number 16 is when the thing starts to light up in the evening and it becomes a beacon. How do we, how were we able to do that? We were once again working together with lighting engineers and so they know how it was very important. And the next slide shows a gentleman that you just met. Yes. He was visiting Honolulu. Yes, your son Joey. Mm hmm and he used to go to school to automotive engineering management school in one town over. So we checked out uh, this uh, the, the building here, as we will do when we go there. And then the next slide is a nice situation, which shows there is something intriguing here and there about its appearance being different if you approach it one, from one side than you approach it from the other side. And the next slide is uh, the next two slides, I mean, the compilation of next slide number um, 19 here is, which when we move to the next slide already, number 20, is the publisher's favorite view, which is more this elevational uh, perception. And we, we see a person reappearing that you were pointing out, uh, the male-dominated jury here. One of them was David Chipperfield, and the project Got, and these are readings, again, that we would like to pass out and give you guys as for preparation for the project. And so this one here is an international tour guide uh, by the Faden Publisher, a Destination Architecture, and it was lucky to be published side by side with our uh, inspiration and sort of informal mentor, David Chipperfield. So the, 
Uh, next slide, second to last, number 21. We will, we're will. we planning to go one town over as well, which is uh, Hamburg, the big city. And you see already other infrastructural uh, systems here uh, floating. So that is something that is being in Honolulu, being a coastal city, very interesting to see how cities develop. And there is a neighborhood that was pretty much built from scratch. So it has a lot to do with um, you know, circumstances that we have in Takahako as well. Yeah. And last but not at all least, what would be the final deliverable of the tour? Of the well, the final tour? deliverable is going to be a show on ThinkTech about these, these, uh, the trip that we t are going to take. And I'm including me because I'm going to go on one of those um, to see awesome. these different architectural uh, pieces. And it'll be that the kids, or the, not the kids, but the students who do this will do a show on ThinkTech describing what they saw and what they learned. Absolutely. Can't wait for that. Obviously, we're then, after having been stuck at our places for a while, we're even more eager to get out again yeah. um, and check things out in the world that we can learn from. Yes. So with that, we're at the end of the show. Um, we're going to see you all back next week. And uh, you and I, DeSoto, will keep our you know, fingers out into the wind and see what's happening around us. Obviously, things significantly do different than before. So we also won't continue to business as usual, but shed a light on the very specific yeah. challenges that we're facing through Corona these days. Right. And um, next week, we will, we can already say we're going to do a presentation that we wanted to do for AIA. Uh, who has the architecture week and obviously can't happen physically, but we want to make up for that and and and, and share our uh, presentation this way. Yep. So see you then. Okay, and bye. Until then, stay safe and sound. Bye bye.